get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And uh, Matthew, I have some interesting folks uh, that you should check out, uh, that people should check out other episodes. I had John Medved that started at um, that started our crowd. And, uh, you know, oftentimes some of the investors, VCs, I like to ask what their biggest miss was. Um, because you, there's so many deals that come across your plate, you can't get them all. And he talked about early on, he had the opportunity to invest in Salesforce really early on and he passed on it. Um, and so Fabrice Grinda talks about his meeting with Snoop Dogg and some other rappers in his early venture. And now he does uh, investing as well. And before I introduce today's guest, which I'm excited about, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Um, at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And the number one thing, you know, Matthew, my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships in a podcast over the past over 10 years has allowed me to profile others, their thought leadership, and really the people I admire what they're doing in the universe. So if you have questions and you're thinking about starting a podcast, go to rise25.com. Um, and you can email support at rise25media.com. Um, I'm super excited about today's guest. Uh, we have Matthew Lemerl. He's the co-founder and managing partner of Fifth Era and of Karetsu Capital. And it's the most active early stage venture investors backing almost 200 companies a year. They backed over 20 unicorns, including Airbnb, Spotify, Coinbase, and many more. Matthew's advised leading companies, including Amazon, Cisco, eBay, Google, HP, Microsoft, and even more than that on growth and innovation. And he's an expert in economic value creation. And Matthew, when I was reading about you, um, you even helped drive annual savings of over $2 billion at a leading retailer and $1 billion um, also at a leading bank. Um, and it, it's just, I, I, when I do these intros, it's like, I try and make them short, but if there's too many good things, it's hard for me to make them short. But, um, you did all this with your wife while raising five children, which is a feat in itself. And people should check out the books you've written. Um, there's one with you and, and Allison Davis, the intelligent investor, um, the Silicon Valley practical wisdom for investors and entrepreneurs from 50 leading Silicon Valley angels and venture capitalists. So Matthew, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me here, Jeremy. I'm looking forward to it. What made you decide to write that book? Well, so for us, uh, this journey has gone from being consultants through to being investors and advisors. And that transition required a lot of learning. And we love it. You know, we've been in Silicon Valley 35 years and we just love being part of the innovation ecosystem. We love the passion and ambition of entrepreneurs. And as investors, we, we like the returns we get. But along the way, you learn things and then you read other things and you say, oh, my gosh, I think I know some things that could be helpful to other people. But I'm not seeing it in some of the books and, and articles that are out there. And so we, Alice and I, took it upon ourselves to try and share what we'd learned. And that was the first book, Build Your Fortune in the Fifth Era, which really explains why we think uh, the world is you know, going through unprecedented times and provides a lot of opportunity to entrepreneurs and founders, as well as investors. It's sort of why should you participate in early stage tech? And then this most recent book, The Intelligent Investor, it's, you know, we, we thought that rather than write a book about what we've learned, we'd get 50 of the best VCs and angels to share their wisdom, and we'd put it all in one book. So you sort of get 50 books in one book. And I promise you, if you're an entrepreneur, and if you're planning to raise capital for many of those 50 people, the least you should do is read. Uh, yeah, exactly. The least you should do is read because you'll learn so much about them and, and what their personal uh, you know, preferences are and how they assess entrepreneurs and what it is they're looking for entrepreneurs. And, and I think you'll do a much better job of approaching them if you've, if you've read the book. 100%. What were some of the answers that stuck out to you? 
or people uh, yeah. and some of the answers? Yeah, well, the, the, the macro point is this is really a people business and we think it's a investment business, but this is not like real estate or public equities and private equity late stage where it's all about the numbers. This is really early stage investing and it's about the people and the best entrepreneurs understand how to create great teams and the best investors are very good at partnering with those people and they don't just bring capital, they bring expertise and it becomes a partnership. And there's a lot more specificity around that point, um, but it's important to understand it. The best entrepreneurs know how to get the best out of their investors and it's not just capital, it's everything else. And, you know, in the scheme of things, I know when you don't have any capital, it feels like it's all about fundraising. But actually, the moment you have capital, you realize it was, it was never about the money. It's about having a team of people that are going to help you accomplish the vision you've set. And uh, if you build a really good team of investors, advisors, coaches, experts, as well as employees and team members, your, your startup has a much higher probability of getting to the destination that you've established. Yeah, yeah, it's all about the people, right? I mean, the people are running everything. Um, you know, I was talking with someone the other day, Matthew, and we were talking about early on, and they were a company that was seeking investment. And I was asking, how do you value a company when you don't have customers yet? And it's an idea. And he's like, well, an investor may have a very different answer to this because he was raising money. How do you, when someone's coming in with an idea, what, how are you valuing the company at the early stage? It's, it's really yes. difficult. Well, it is really difficult, but I don't, uh, uh, it's, it's less about a quantitative analysis of discounted cash flow, it's, which is based upon the business plan and the projections. It's more about a dialogue around a series of funding events that are going to take place over the first two or three years, a cap table, a capitalization table for the company, and a fair and equitable way of uh, splitting up both the equity of the company and the work of the company of which the capital that's going to be used is a component. And so we tend to have a dialogue with the entrepreneurs, you know, you've got to have enough of the company for this to make sense to you. We're going to bring something to the table, capital and resources. And now we have to establish a cap table where we feel we're getting enough. And then we know the first round isn't the only round. So let's map that out, round two, round three. What's happening for you in terms of dilution? What's happening to us in terms of dilution? And how do we make this work for the follow-on investors that also have to be part of the puzzle? And so um, I think that uh, we, we see errors occurring all the time. One error is that entrepreneurs don't want to give away any of the company at the beginning, and then they can't attract investors. Another er error is they give too much of the company away to their co-founders, and they don't have multi-year vesting. And that basically kills the deal because they get passive partners who own a lot of equity but aren't doing any work. And then, and then no one else wants to come in later. These are examples, of course. So um, a sophisticated investor working with a good entrepreneur will map out a multi-year funding strategy. And then the valuation will be an output variable. It won't be the input variable. It's, it's really interesting, did. Matthew, yeah. because it's you're you're looking at, you know, some people think you look in this finite point in time, but you're looking at like the entire picture because of your experience. And like, if we do this now, how's that going to affect all these future people who would want to come in? Is it desirable for them with the helping of the growth of the company? And, and the entrepreneur too. I mean, a, a smart entrepreneur knows that having an awful lot of nothing is nothing. Uh, and so you've got to figure out, you know, I as the entrepreneur, I'm going to give up certain things as time goes by. I'm going to give up ownership. I'm, I may have to give up control. Um, I may need to uh, uh, also give up, uh, you know, operating responsibility and control because I have to build a team and I have to trust other people to make decisions. All of these things are going to dynamically change over time. And, you know, you as an entrepreneur, 
if you're sophisticated, are going to map that out in your own mind. And as you say, uh, Jeremy, it's going to be a three to five year thought process, not a I, I'm here to do a round and I, I want the maximum possible valuation and the minimum possible capital because that's not actually the right answer typically. You have some really good questions with some of these uh, rock star investors in your book. Um, one of my favorites is about what they wanted to be as a child. And you kind of get this insight into something. So for you, what was it like growing up and, and what did you want to be? Yes. Well, it's a good question, Jeremy. So, um, you know, I, 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 I made a decision at university that pushed me down a certain path. Uh, I decided to be a management consultant and I joined McKinsey and company and I turned out to be good at it though. Um, you know, for many people, it's a challenging career, but because I was a good management consultant, I stayed in that profession for more than 20 years. And I was good at it. I enjoyed it. I got a lot of benefit from the experiences. You get a lot of diversity across industries and clients and geographies. I probably stayed a consultant longer than I should have in, 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 in retrospect. Why? Why? Because I was yeah. enjoying it and I was good at it. No, I mean, why do you think you oh, stayed? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, because the world is full of opportunities mm. and I'm enjoying what I'm doing today even more. And I probably could have started being a full-time investor earlier. Um, and, and I tried to bridge uh, from one career to the other in parallel. So I tried to do two things at once. Let's be a consultant and also let's be an investor. And I think I probably should have cut the ties to being an advisor a little earlier and jumped ship to being a full-time investor. You know, if I'd done that in the late nineties, when I could have done it, I would have caught the dot-com boom. <laughs> um, right. I, I, uh, Alice and I ended up doing that a little later, uh, but the good, great news is we're catching this boom and uh, we're well positioned for this boom. So, so that's, I guess, the answer to your question. Um, if you ask me um, what other things might I have wanted to be, uh, there was a time very early on, I would have liked to have been a professional athlete and I did compete for many, many years. Uh, but I'm not sure I was ever quite good enough to be mm. a professional, uh, you know, in my sports. So. It's a tough one. You know, I want to talk about first. We all remember our first. But before we do, do you have one, like I mentioned with John Medvens and the others, a, a miss that looking, you know, yes. hindsight's always twenty twenty, but like at the time, it wasn't so obvious. Yes. Well, many. Actually, Jeremy, many. And in fact, uh, I would quote Mike Moritz on this, the the chairman of Sequoia and one of the world's best VCs. And, and Mike has said to us, and he said to other people, um, uh, you know, it is the missus that keeps him up and uh, up at night. And he worries more about why he didn't invest in something that went on to be successful, mm. even though he's had a lot of great wins along the way. Um, you know, missing something means that you were fishing in the right pond to mix metaphors right you were fishing in the right pond and the fish were there and you happened not to catch the big fish but you were in the right pond so um, it comes with the territory it's okay uh, we so what are mine i mean I, I, there are so many but i'll pick out two right now one is ethereum and another one is ripple so uh blockchain capital where allison is the advice uh, the advice uh, the chairman of the advisory board and we are LPs in all of their funds. We love blockchain capital. Uh, Brad and Bart uh, took me to a dinner with Vitalik Buterin right at the beginning. And he was looking for people to participate and support in Ethereum. And he was still ready to give out blocks of Ethereum at very low prices. And I didn't get it. And I really didn't get it at all at the time. Um, I didn't know what a smart contract was and what I didn't understand what was wrong with Bitcoin blockchain and so on and so on today i do so today i would have grabbed as many blocks from vitalik as we I could say have. blockchain co-investors like right over your shoulder there yes yeah yeah, so. yeah well we we are the world's leading venture fund to fund focused on blockchain so 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 that's one ethereum and a uh, ripple uh our very you know a good friend of ours greg kidd who we had backed back in the 90s with his partner linda jenkinson in the formation of dispatch management. He then went on with Jack Dorsey to create uh, Twitter and Square. And he called us to a meeting uh, 
in, at his home in Sausalito, uh, where he wanted to talk about Ripple, but we didn't go. <laughs> Why? Well, we had something else come up that evening mm. and we had five kids and we had a lot of things on our plate. That's so, understandable, Matthew. Five yes, kids uh, trumps a lot of things. Yeah, but obviously um, we wouldn't have, we probably wouldn't have been in on the formation of Ripple and XRP, but we could have added value early in its life cycle and maybe we would have received uh, blocks of XRP along the way. And who knows? Um, so these are two examples. But but Jeremy, the, the point is, you've got to be fishing in the right pond. And as an entrepreneur, that means you've got to be launching companies where the tailwinds are behind you. And for investors, it means you've got to be investing with the best investors uh, and getting access to the best deal flow. So, so whichever you are, if you're in the right place, you will miss things. And that's absolutely fine. Okay. That's, that's, uh, I like that, that way of looking at it, uh, Matthew. Um, what's some, a good piece of advice um, that you've gotten from Michael Moritz? I was looking at your site and he said, you know, investing in young companies is, is a hazardous undertaking, yeah. right? Uh, and where most uh, people lose. And he says, Matthew suggests ways to avoid that fate. What's some advice that he's given you or from your conversations that's been valuable? Yes. So Mike Moritz is a very sophisticated person and he's a former journalist. That's how he began his career. And before that, he went to Christchurch, Oxford, which is where I was educated. Alison has met him a few times because she's actually been on boards with him. And in fact, Sequoia has had Alison, who is my partner, as well as my wife. He's had Alison, uh, you know, they've had Alison help with a couple of companies uh, in the preparation and run up to the IPO. Um, because Allison is a audit committee chair and a public company board director. So, so that's sort of the context. I don't want to pretend that I sit every day with Mike Moritz and we chat, um, but I've had, the, uh, I've had the benefit of listening to him a few times. Um, I think the blurb he wrote for our book, which is what you just quoted, <laughs> is actually a very sophisticated way of giving us a blurb without endorsing the content of it. Because <laughs> <laughs> what he's actually saying, if you, if you read it, if you pass his blurb, it basically says you can lose all your money. And I'm, I don't know that Matthew has the answer and Matthew and Allison have the answer either because they suggest things, but he's not endorsing that our suggestions are good. So he's a very sophisticated <laughs> guy. We were very appreciative that he wrote a blurb for the book. Um, and that he read our book. And, um, but at the same time, I can tell he didn't actually endorse our book, but he did give us a blurb and it's on the front, uh, on the back cover of the book. And, and thank you very much, Mike, for doing that. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing. So one of the questions that I also love is you ask people, what's your first technology investment and what happened? Um, yeah. And it doesn't have to be your first, but what what has been one of maybe first or most influential as far as early on uh, investments for you? Yeah, well, I'm happy. Well, okay, no, that's the way you asked the question. You changed my response. I was going to tell you a story of uh, our first formal angel investment. Okay, uh, but I'm not going to because actually the better story goes way back. Given mm. the way you finished that question. Um, when I was at McKinsey in New York, uh, back in the very early, well, the end of the 80s and the early 90s, um, I was doing projects, um, which in retrospect were groundbreaking. But at the time, I don't think we understood just how much they would end up being so. So, for example, I worked on a lot of projects at Sears, and Sears at the time owned Prodigy. And I was learning about Prodigy before anyone had heard about America Online. And of course, or of course, Prodigy lost an American online, at, at least in that phase one. But because I had insights into how you could dial up and see a catalog online and how cool that was, which is sort of what Prodigy was, it was the Sears catalog online through an access point. It made us invest in America online. And this is, and we were public investors because America online had already IPO'd, but we rode America online right through the 90s, and that was a tremendous uh, returning investment. A second one I would mention is actually something called Catalina Marketing. And Catalina Marketing at the time, this is way back, you know, 30 years ago, 
or something. Catalina Marketing allowed for the customized printing of, to of, of, uh, of uh, coupons when you were checking out at the register at the grocery store. Hmm. Right? So if do you remember that, you sort of, you went to the grocery store, you bought- Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, Safeways print out your receipt. Yeah, it's on the and, receipt and you yeah, get, exactly. I just bought oatmeal. It's like, oh, next time you buy oatmeal, you get a dollar off or something. Well, it's, it's a bit more targeted than that. It's yeah. like you just bought Pampers and then they tell you you can get uh, something off baby food. So they are actually watching what you bought and they're giving you a customized coupon. Well, the point is that was the, my first realization of the power of one-on-one um, -on -one marketing at point of sale, real-time one-on-one marketing. And uh, it meant that if I combine those two things, you know, uh, the understanding that the internet was going to give us access in ways that we couldn't imagine before, and the realization that targeted marketing in real time could be possible and unleashed by that connectivity and by the ability to do computing in real time based upon the click clickstream activity or the behaviors of, of a user, uh, that set us up very well for understanding why the internet was a lot more than just an electronic commerce platform. And, uh, and as consultants, that was very helpful when we were launching or helping launch, say, at bankamerica.com or a gap.com, which I worked on. But for Alice and I, for our investing, it meant that we have invested, uh, you know, probably a slightly ahead of the curve uh, on the internet companies, including those like Amazon and Apple and Tencent and Alibaba that have risen to be the world's most valuable companies. We've, we've understood what they were doing because of those very early experiences. Yeah. I mean, you have this unique viewpoint of seeing so many different businesses and what they're doing in the businesses. By the time it comes to more of the public, it's like some of those people are seeing it for the first time and you're like, no, I've been, I've been kind of seeing parts of this for five years or 10 years. So to you, it makes sense in, I don't know if you consider yourself an early adopter, like you've seen the technologies maybe years before anyone else has seen it, right? Yes. Well, I, you say me. I mean, this, I think uh, part of why I think living in Silicon Valley in California is a privilege is because we see the future a little bit earlier than most people in the world. Now, we're not unique in that. You could be living in, Beijing and Shanghai and Hong Kong, and you could be living in, you know, Tokyo, and you could be living in Zug, Switzerland or London. And those are also innovation hubs. And Austin, Texas is and Boston is and there are a few. But uh, if you compare 8 billion people and where they live to where the world's future innovations are being created, the, relatively few of us live in the innovation hubs. And so I'm agreeing with your point, which is 35 years in Silicon Valley, you, you see things and you can connect dots that are a little bit harder for those people who are not living in an innovation setting. Uh, and, and of course, you can always watch the YouTube video. Uh, right, 8 billion people can watch the video, but we're actually living in it. And, and even though we've all gone virtual you know, in this terrible pandemic, I still feel I'm a little bit more connected into this innovation ecosystem than many. Um, we also make a lot more mistakes, which is going back to the point about fishing in the right pool. You know, I'm living in the right pond um, uh, in Silicon Valley. I also spend a lot of time in London and Zurich, Azug and uh, other places. So I, I'm living in the right ponds, but, I, but by definition, failure is part of that too. And I can show you all of the failures and there have been many, but it just comes with the territory. So. You know, um, I, I feel there's also that, you know, eurythmic song, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And I feel that better to have risked and lost than never to have risked at all. Yeah, I mean, you ask people, I forgot who was talking about this, someone who's 80, 90, 100, and they're thinking about what they regret, not something that they did, and then they missed out on because they did it yes uh, yeah. well i i think that's true too um you know uh i uh you know we uh you know uh gandalf says it in lord of the rings right uh 
all we have to decide is how to spend the time that is allotted to us. And when we're living in, in this time of unprecedented innovation and change, I think that if we get to the end of our lives and we look back and said, we didn't even try to participate in changing the world in the direction we wanted it to go. I think I, for one, would regret that. So I, I love uh, working with entrepreneurs who are changing the world. And if I can help them and also sometimes steer them a little bit um, in the direction of the future that I want, then I think uh, for myself and for my children and so on, then I think that that would, is time well spent. Matthew, you know, we talked a little bit before we hit record about um, right now, what you see with your unique viewpoint as emerging opportunities. Yes. Well, it's, 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 the world is full of emerging opportunities because we, we are the luckiest humans that have ever lived. I mean, we sometimes lose sight of that because of things like a pandemic or global inequality or uh, you know, a lack of um, appreciation of diversity. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that get away. Uh, but fundamentally, we're living through a time of innovation and change, where for the most part, the world is getting better every day. And our lifespans, uh, you know, are for the most part lengthening. Uh, poverty is for the most part getting diminished, and so on and so on. So, so there's a lot of positive things happen. Technology and innovation are the drivers of most of those positive things. That doesn't mean they don't have externalities and that they don't create disruptive change. And the disruptive change disadvantages some companies, some people, and even some geographies. You know, there are whole regions that are getting disrupted and they are unfortunately having to go through, uh, you know, some suffering in their transition to their new futures. But for humankind as a whole, I feel we're moving in a positive direction. So you say, well, what are the specifics of that? There, there's so many, but there's three I would call out. The first is we're continuing to tr transition towards a digital world. We're halfway in that process. The internet got us halfway, but now we have to complete the journey, which means digital money is digital assets and an internet of value as well as an internet of communication. The second is the life sciences revolution where I'm a little bit less of an, uh, you know, engaged, um, but we are now moving into a world of personalized medicine and rapid uh, health solutions. I mean, even the creation of the virus, uh, the, the, uh, the vaccines for this terrible pandemic that we're in has occurred faster than we could ever have imagined if we went back 10 years and new technologies and tools are making that happen. Um, I, I am a little fearful about the reality that we can not only genetically engineer plants and animals, but human beings too. And I don't know where that heads and, and, and I have some fear around that. And then the third is finally, we have clean, uh, clean sources of energy and of power and of business activity that I think will begin to mitigate the uh, negative externalities of our, of our progress. You know, the big collateral damage of human progress has been felt by the earth and the, the world that we live in. And I think we're finally turning the corner where we can shrink our footprints, our carbon footprints and our activity. And I think that that's a very positive thing. So for the entrepreneurs listening, Jeremy, um, I think those are the three big opportunity areas are essentially FinTech and blockchain, life sciences, the continuation of what we've been doing, and clean energy. And then there are others as well, but those are the three big narratives, I think, of the next decade. And if you're an entrepreneur, I would go, I would pick at least one of those tailwinds and ride it. And you can probably combine two out of the three. I, I think if you can get a perfect trifecta, I'm not quite sure what it is, but there probably is a trifecta where you create a startup that benefits from all three of those macro trends, and that could be a good place to focus. Yeah. Talk about the starting um, and running of uh, Fifth Era. Yes. So when we were, so Fifth Era is Allison and my family office. Um, and you can go to fifthera.com and learn about what we do. You know, um, we called it Fifth Era because of this belief that the world is transitioning into a new 
phase of existence. And the first four um, began hunter-gatherer, agricultural, mercantile, and industrial. And the industrial era, we believe, is coming to an end. So, so you'll hear other people like the world's you know, economic forum say we're moving into the next industrial revolution and that this is the fourth industrial revolution. We don't buy into that. We think we're moving out of the industrial era into a new era and we don't know how to name it. So we called it the fifth era. But the point is many, for 200 years, we've operated in a world where we take certain beliefs as gospel, uh, beliefs like scale matters and that you have to begin local and then go regional and then go global. And that the corporate structure, uh, public corporate structure is the, right, is the right model. You know, we have public entities, they issue stock, uh, they have boards of directors, you're an employee, you work 48 hours a week in a place of, of work, you only have one employer at a time and you get a pension, you know, all these things we take for granted, but none of those need to be true. They weren't true more than 200 years ago, and they may not be true in the future either. And in fact, I think the evidence suggests that this fifth era is gonna be very different. We'll multitask, we may get, you know, for who knows what will happen. We may get, you know, working wages paid by our government and, and anything we choose to do may be at our own volition how we spend our time and some of us will choose to work hard and others may want to be artists or painters or podcasters or whatever. Um, so we've written books on this and I know that that for some people what I just said may sound confusing and so on. We've been pretty thoughtful about it. There are some books. There's a free book called The Fifth Era which you can get at fifthera.com and it just sort of establishes a foundation why is the world going to be very different going forward than it was in the past? And again, for entrepreneurs, I think you do do very well to sit back and really think about this because, you know, the knee jerk reaction would be, look, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to do a seed round. I'll go and talk to my friends and family and maybe I'll do an angel round. Well, you don't have to do any of that anymore. You can crowdfund, you can create a token and you can issue a token to your fans you can pre-sell. There are so many things you can do to fund your startup that weren't in place 10 years ago. The world is shifting. And um, should you create a enterprise or should you create a project and a network and a community? You know, entrepreneurs are at the leading edge of this change because you're creating a new enterprise to build out some new technology and so you don't have to operate within the constraints of the industrial era anymore. And we think that's all pretty exciting. Yeah. I think, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Matthew, but I think when you went out to demonstrate this to, um, you know, to someone who kind of knows certain companies and you're talking about industrial era, you, you kind of mapped out the world's largest companies by market cap. And you sh it seemed like you showed the shift of like, okay, at the top, was like the Exxons of the world. And then you started to slowly see the Microsoft and Apples and Googles shift into those top positions. Is that kind of just to wrap the head around the fifth era? Is that kind of where you see things transitioning? Is that what you mean by kind of industrial era to fifth era? Or is that something different? I think that's an indicator of the change that mm -hmm. the world's most valuable companies are companies that know how to operate in a very different environment and they know how to serve global markets with technology and, and scale themselves very rapidly and become very profitable in doing that. But that isn't quite what we're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an indicator. Indicator, what, got it. What we're talking about is how does innovation and new technology undermine the assumptions upon which today's businesses and activities are, are founded? And so, uh, you know, an example, and I know we're running out of time, Jeremy, so we, we may end up having to do part one and part <laughs> two, um, because this is, I'm really enjoying your questions. But um, the university is a great example of a construct that we take for granted today, but the underlying foundation of the assumptions have all been knocked out. You know, that knowledge is scarce, 
it's in the minds of professors. You have to go to visit them to learn and you have to learn in a classroom. And so we have universities. 100%. Uh, just None really of quickly. Those assumptions are true. None of those assumptions are true anymore. Uh, we yeah. no longer need universities. You could do electronic based yeah. learning and uh, it could be distributed in 8B. 8 billion people could benefit from it. Sorry, Jeremy. No, I was going to, I didn't want, I want you to keep on with that stream of thought because I really want to hear what you think should happen or will happen. But I just literally got off the phone an hour ago. The person's like, I wish they would YouTube. I wouldn't have needed to get my MBA is what they said, you know? Um, and it's kind of along those lines of, well, the, the information is, is out there. What do you think? Like, cause there are still universities, right? Sure. And, and, what do you think should be happening? And it, it's expensive. Like for a normal human being, like going to a university is not cheap, you know? Yes. Well, so I think, I think the, the point of that narrative is that when you knock out the underlying assumptions, you get to, uh, the chance to redesign things in a different way. So you can still call it university, but, you know, um, it should be cheaper and technology should allow us to drive down the cost curve. So we shouldn't be bankrupting students in the educational process. We should be able to make it more accessible to hundreds of thousands and millions of people, not the, you know, the, the couple of thousand that are able to arrive on campus and sit in dorms and sit in classrooms. We should be able to reverse the pedagogical um, um, methodology so that, that something that hands-on experiences occur in the classroom and the things that can be learned remotely are learned remotely. Whereas we've had this historical model where you get talked to in the classroom in a broadcast mode, and then you go and do the interactive work in case study groups outside the classroom. Well, maybe that should be reversed where you do the broadcast communication through YouTube. And when you come to the classroom with the professor, you get hands-on tutoring and engagement or something like that. I made that up. Uh, my only point of it is that the fundamental approach can be broken down. You know, as a Oxford and a Stanford grad, I've greatly uh, benefited from my educational experiences, but 8 billion people didn't. <laughs> I was one of the lucky ones, right? I wish Oxford yeah. and Stanford would educate the world, not just educate the lucky ones. Yeah. Right. I'm, a, I'm fiercely pro uh, I'm a very loyal alumni of Oxford and Stanford. I just wish they would educate 8 billion people, not the handful of us that were lucky to go there. Yeah. yeah. I have one last question, Matthew, because we're running out of time, but I want to point people towards your website, you know, Fifth Era. Um, where, you know, in Karitsu, where else should we point people towards just to check out? I know you have a personal website, MatthewLamurl.com. Where yeah. else should we point people point people to online to check more out about what you're working on yes so so listen i i know we're out of time today i'm happy to do a part two jeremy but for the entrepreneurs um if you're trying to get smart about launching a company uh, there's some free resources at fifthera.com including this book um and a bunch of webinars including webinars on how to raise capital and the fundamentals of early stage technology investing um if they then want to raise money, I highly recommend they go to KoretsuForum.com. It's the world's largest angel group, and they love helping entrepreneurs launch their businesses. Um, BlockchainCoInvestors.com is for investors. We're the world's leading venture funder fund focused on fintech and blockchain. And um, as you and I spoke about, uh, you know, if there are investors in your organization and your, your network, uh, blockchain.com sorry blockchaincoinvestors.com is the place they should go okay so in yeah. the last couple minutes a few my last question is um your kids um what yeah. would you say they what would they say what do you would you say they say would learn learned from you have they followed in your footsteps and um what what have you think from talking to them big uh, been big lessons that they have learned from you so. I think they've learned more from their mother than they have from me. <laughs> well, let's go and with mother then. <laughs> yes, yes. What they've yeah. learned, uh, what I hope they've learned from their mother, and I'm sure they would say this, is uh, being positive, being supportive of others, being relationship oriented and trying to help other people succeed gets you a lot more personal satisfaction, 
um, than uh, always making it about you. And um, I definitely, I learned that, that from her as well. Uh, from me, um, I, I pride myself on, on being able to look a little bit over the horizon and trying to connect the dots of uh, change in the environment in which I live. And um, I, I'd like to think I passed along some of that. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot of uh, less positive traits, in, including talking too much and not asking enough questions. I know nothing about Jeremy. I'd love to learn. This is not about him. me. This was about you. <laughs> I want to be the first one to thank you, yeah. Matthew. Everyone should sure. check out fifthair.com, critsaforum.com, and everywhere else on the internet. And thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. And I look forward, if you're ever interested in doing part two, I'm happy to. Thanks, Matthew. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.